Cherubs, for as long as I've been alive, the imagery created by Keith Haring has been ubiquitous. It's on murals, the covers of magazines. I remember seeing it on MTV. I even remember one time that Clarissa Explains It All had it on her t-shirt. And to this day, I still see his imagery on shorts worn by teenagers in my classroom. For me, his radiant baby, barking dog, and dancing man seem like they've always existed, and perhaps because of that, they've somehow slipped into the background for me. I think that I've taken them for granted. I've allowed them to sit in my visual vocabulary uncritically and without giving them the attention that they actually deserve. So I'm going to fix that today. I'm going to let Keith Haring's vibrating figures work their magic on me. And as I work through my thoughts and feelings about his work, we're going to dip into the earliest parts of art history before taking a turn towards semiotics and contemporary art theory. Investigating the work of Keith Haring took me in some interesting directions, including the philosophy around graffiti art. So if looking at art and exploring the ideas within it seems like it's your kind of thing, please consider subscribing and let's dig into the work of Keith Haring. So in 1983, Keith Haring was asked to paint the fence that outlined the construction site of a new museum, the Haggerty Museum in Wisconsin. And before starting on the part of the fence that he was actually hired to paint, he went to the reverse side, the site that faced towards the highway, and he painted a series of crawling babies above these animal figures, which are usually identified as dogs. Since these were painted onto the side of the fence facing the highway, he wanted anybody driving by to be able to see and interpret the work, so he kept it simple. Babies and dogs. If he drew something more detailed, people may not have been able to read the work from far away or process it in the short time that they have as they drive. And I wanted to start the essay with this work and this anecdote because I think it tells us a lot. First, it makes a statement that art is a part of life. Fences, by their very nature, keep something in or they keep something out. Consequently, his decision to put his artwork on both sides of the fence implies that art belongs everywhere. We can't fence in the art world. Making art, to quote John Green, has never been optional for humans. To expand on that idea, when you enter a museum, you prepare yourself to find meaning in the artifacts that you encounter. When you leave the museum, you may be tempted to leave that mentality behind, to compartmentalize where art can be and where it can't be. The world outside the museum, or on the other side of the fence, doesn't demand the critical engagement the same way that the art inside the museum does. So Herring forces his artwork into the public eye by painting it on the opposite side of the fence. He made this fence an obvious point of contact between the art world and the public rather than a literal wall that would separate them. Keith Herring made art for public consumption and discussion, and that brings me to the work and actions that made Herring famous in the first place. Between 1980 and 1985, Keith Herring produced somewhere between five and 10,000 drawings inside the New York City subway system. If you were in New York during those years, you saw these drawings. So let's put them in some context. Famously, New York had a rough end to the 1970s. It had blackouts, riots, and narrowly avoided bankruptcy. So New York in the early 80s, it wasn't doing too well. And when advertising space in the subways went unused, a black sheet of paper occupied that space. And there were a lot of blank spaces in the early 1980s. Keith Haring would ride around the subway looking for these black sheets of paper, take his white chalk, and quickly draw something. He needed to be quick about it. He could be fined or arrested if caught, and he was. But this quick and prolific production is where and how he developed his characteristic style. These drawings were public and they were temporary. Similar to images on the reverse side of the fence, they took a simple form, meant to be viewed while in transit. They used archetypal imagery, the figure of a human devoid of any identifying features, the figure of an animal, simple shapes. And watching that famous footage of Herring entering the subway and then drawing this figurative art, I can't help but think of the artwork created tens of thousands of years ago in caves. He's a man entering a cave and performing a ritual. So I want to first situate Herring's work in the context of cave art. I don't pretend to have answers for why prehistoric humans went into caves to make art, but historical consensus seems to consistently link the creation of art in caves with rituals and religious activity. And I think that linking Herring's practice to ritual and religion makes sense as well. 
He, after all, uses a bunch of religious imagery. He painted on Greek vases, which makes the connection between his work and Greek friezes and mythology. A lot of his busier compositions evoke the walls of Egyptian temples. In a really obvious example, you can visit a triptych altarpiece that he made in the Grace Chapel Cathedral in San Francisco. His work wouldn't, and doesn't, look out of place in religious contexts. His forms feel universal, like they've always been around. I think this connection between Haring's figurative works and religious ritual is a productive connection to make, particularly because in early religious communities, religion often referred to a set of behaviors rather than a set of beliefs. Myths didn't exist simply as a belief system, but as a set of rituals and actions. Like paintings in the Lascaux Cave seem to illustrate myths related to an animal master, and historians often connect these images to hunting rituals. Early human communities performed rituals to connect themselves to the animal world, and the art in these caves seems to both illustrate and participate in those rituals. Ritual is art, and art is ritual. The two concepts cannot be decoupled within the context of cave art. In fact, I think it's impossible to come up with any art form that didn't begin in ritual and religion. Painting, music, dance, sculpture, and so on, they all began with ritual. And Keith Haring, entering the cave of the subway, reconnects us with that history. His art is as much about the ritual of his making it as it is about the forms that he's creating. He made sure to bring photographers with him into the subway as he performed his ritual because the process cannot be decoupled from the product. But don't get me wrong, we can still analyze his forms. His babies crawling in a line above the dogs on that construction fence, they evoke the human-animal connection in the same way that those paintings in Lascaux did. In the prehistoric communities that produced the art in Lascaux, some historians believe that humans were trying to reconcile their need to live with the death of the animals that they hunted. The rituals helped them process a bunch of difficult emotions. Similarly, Keith Haring was helping New York process a difficult time. His work reminds me of a passage I read in Karen Armstrong's book, The Case for God, where she states that if the historians are right about the function of the Lascaux Caves, religion and art were inseparable from the very beginning. Like art, religion is an attempt to construct meaning in the face of relentless pain and injustice of life. As meaning-seeking creatures, men and women fall very easily into despair. They have created religions and works of art to help them find value in their lives, despite all the dispiriting evidence to the contrary. Haring created his cave art in the subways of New York City, and he drew inspiration from the graffiti artists of the 1970s, the break dancers of the early 80s, and the dancing he witnessed in the Paradise Garage, a dance club for the queer community of New York that he went to every single Saturday night. In other words, his drawings drew inspiration from art forms created within disenfranchised communities within the struggling metropolis of that time period. In a city that seemed to be dying after the financial struggles and blackouts of the 1970s, and while watching his friends die during the AIDS epidemic, Haring's art asserts life. So he took the breakdancing happening above ground and painted it in the cave of the subway illustrating the life-affirming rituals of dance for the everyday commuters of the subway. Additionally, and similar to the cave art, his images take simple forms. They don't look realistic. They're not aiming for optical equivalency, nor are they making obscure references to the history of art that might go over everybody's head. He once said that the drawings which I do have very little in common with the drawings in the classical sense as they developed during the Renaissance, and the drawings that imitate life or make a lifelike impression. My drawings do not try to imitate life. They try to create life, to invent life. His radiant baby, for example, is not trying to look like a real baby. Instead, it takes on all the symbolic associations of any baby. New life, innocence, vulnerability. By having that baby appear only in outline and crawling, it's easier to see the connection between the human figure and the animal figure that he paints below it on that fence. It situates humanity among the animal world in a similar way that those images in Lascaux do. But the baby has other meanings too. It's perhaps his most frequently drawn image, and because it's so associated with his aesthetic, the baby can, and often does, serve as a replacement for his name. It becomes his tag. And this places Herring firmly in the tradition of graffiti artists who use a tag in place of a legal name to mark their work. 
So this is going to take us into the way that symbols work in the context of graffiti art. Semiotics is the study of signs and symbols and the way that they're interpreted. In 1975, the French philosopher of semiotics, Jean Baudrillard, wrote an essay about the explosion of graffiti art on trains in New York City in 1972. He makes the argument that the urban landscape of New York had become segregated, that the city was carved up, leaving some areas ignored, that the individuals living in those deprioritized areas made themselves known by writing their names or tags on the trains, which Baudrillard poetically calls the arteries of the city. The names and the aesthetic of these areas would thus be broadcast throughout the entire city, ignored no longer. Baudrillard understood graffiti to be a rebellion against the homogenization of the city through the symbolic coding of certain populations as privileged and the appearance of those codes in advertisements all around the city. Corporations owned and operated by wealthy communities could post advertisements throughout the city and establish homogenizing cultural norms through the visual signifiers of the advertisements. The advertisements make the subway a site of symbolic exchange through the city. They create the symbols that signify wealth and status. They entrenched beauty standards and status symbols for the community, making everybody want the same things. And graffiti, it disrupts this. It tries to change the way the landscape looks with the names and styles of individuals from communities that go underrepresented in advertising. The visual and material culture of a city represent the people inside the city. So if that material culture is dominated by advertisements, that implies that the people who live inside that city are consumers, that the pursuit of the goods and services in those advertisements defines the community that lives inside it. Graffiti attempts to alter those visual signifiers with something messier, something more human, something that isn't going to try to get your money from you. Baudrillard compared the train graffiti of 1972 to tattoos, which he says make the body a place of symbolic exchange. He says that by tattooing the walls with made-up names like super sex and super cool, it frees them from architecture and turns them once again into living social matter into the moving body of the city before it has been branded with function and institutions. In other words, the graffiti turns the trains and the walls of the subway into a social space of recognition, a place where identities can be exchanged in the same way that a tattoo consciously and intentionally makes the body into a site that communicates something about the person inside that body. So rather than let the walls be a place that try to impose a consumer identity onto you, they become a place where people can share their own identities. The graffiti turns the material of the city, the trains and the walls, into a site that communicates something about the communities that live inside that city. All the communities, not just the ones with an advertising budget. So I, I hope that it's clear how this perspective on graffiti relates to Keith Haring. He took over the spaces of the New York City subway system intended for advertisements. Advertisements that transformed individuals into consumers. And he occupied those spaces with dancing bodies, UFOs, and barking dogs. In the course of making thousands of these images, he created his own visual vocabulary, his own style, his own individuality. The space became the site of identity construction under Herring's guideship. And the style of the art is part of the message. It reflects an individual artist rebelling against this homogenization and becoming himself, finding his voice. But it's not just establishing an individual ego. It's also providing the space for others to find their voice. He tattooed those spaces and gave subway riders images to respond to, easily recognizable figures that could be read and interpreted by anyone. And because they could be read and interpreted by anyone, they became sites for discussion and community. As he said, the drawings do not try to imitate life. They try to create life, to invent life. And the social interaction inspired by the drawings, that is life. It's people being people rather than consumers. And the images are simple and vague enough that anybody can view them differently. An interesting feature of the repeated symbolism in Herring's work is that the same symbol can change meaning depending on the context and depending on the reader viewing it. So take that barking dog, for example. Because of the simplicity of this image, it can signify different things. It, first of all, doesn't even need to be a dog. Some people see a coyote or a wolf. What I usually view as barking could be panting, it could be biting. 
depending on what the other symbols are around it, the symbol of the dog can change meaning. In this context, I see the dog barking. In this context, I see it as singing. And in this context, I see it as a golden calf in a Bible story. And in this one, never, never mind. I hope that doesn't get me demonetized. The point is that his images function like language. They're almost like those poetry magnets that sometimes people have on their fridge. As you move the words around, the meaning of the phrases changes and the individual words themselves take on different connotative meanings. Herring's work functions like a vocabulary. Depending on the other images around them, they take on new meanings and it's up to us, the public, the viewer of the piece, to build a relationship with the signs on these walls and with each other through discourse and conversation. Haring wrote in his journal when he started art school at SVA that he was interested in making art to be experienced and explored by as many individuals as possible with as many different individual ideas about the given piece with no final meaning attached. So to close this essay, I want to take an image of his that I particularly like and join the chorus of voices who have had individual ideas about a given piece. I want to participate in the conversation that he created, in that life that he created with these images. So in this black and white image, I see two people so committed to dancing with each other and so in sync with each other that they have actually fused together. They've lost themselves in the ritual of dance and in doing so found a real connection with another individual in the world. And in that fusion, they formed a pair of liberating scissors. The dancing inspired the union, and then the union inspired liberation. And this dance and the resulting scissors cut them free from this cord which threatens to bind them. And this dancing, it doesn't just set them free, it also sets others free. Because they found each other, they're able to liberate another human being from bondage. For me, this image communicates the idea that through rituals of artistic production, like dance, like drawing, we can create relationships with each other and the world, and we can liberate ourselves and others from the symbols or categories that imprison us. That's what I see. What about you?